Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Lens podcast, where we are viewing the animal experience. Today, I'm joined by the fabulous and eloquent co-host of this podcast, Rebecca Madrid, and our brilliant guest of this episode, Ivan Tacey. Um, Ivan Tacey is a so sociocultural anthropologist and multi-species ethnographer specializing in Southeast Asia, perhaps most uh, especially the, the Batek from Malaysia. And uh, while Rebecca and I know Ivan from his work at the University of Exeter, he's currently lecturing in Plymouth. And today I think we'll be talking a bit about Ivan's upcoming publications. So it's just worth mentioning that he has two books due to be published in the near future, um, one entitled Walking with Tigers and the second entitled Cosmic Entanglements, Shamanism and Cosmopolitics among the Batek of Malaysia. And we'll be sure to share, you know, links to both of these in the podcast description as well, and keep you updated on that. Um, but no one wants to hear me rambling on, so I'll pass it over to Ivan. Um, Ivan, feel free to share anything that I failed to mention, and we'd love to hear a bit about, you know, your research and introduction to that, and an introduction to your work as well. Thanks a lot for your introduction. That's just about right. That's what I'm doing at the moment. In fact, um, down at the University of Plymouth, um, I'm lecturing in anthropology criminology and sociology well sociology part starting in September so it's quite nice to be spread across the social sciences and like like you said before extra I was um, teaching anthropology and anthrozoology so the criminological teaching now um, well I aim in the future to really direct that towards what you call green criminology and uh, indigenous criminology. So I'm particularly interested in environmental crimes, corporate crimes, um, uh, especially those perpetuated against indigenous peoples, which we see across the globe, you know, whether it's um, Central and uh, Western Africa, Amazonia, Papua New Guinea, Southeast Asia. So I'm interested in looking at that, looking at why we have disproportionate numbers of um, indigenous peoples in um, criminal justice systems. So as um, Rebecca certainly is well aware of in Canada, this has been a major problem, but um, anthropologists and others have been discussing this for quite a few years in places like Canada, Australia, and United States of America, but much less so in, in other places like Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and so forth. So I'm quite interested in getting into that kind of things yeah and thank and thanks a lot for mentioning my two books so we can come back to that in a bit yeah yeah definitely yeah yeah so is that any of those topics that you mentioned now is that something that's working into into those books as well was there one that was a, a graphic novel I think you mentioned or was that yeah so um the first book walking with tigers with that one I'm collaborating with the artist John Herbert and actually um We've kind of got enough material for several books, but we're focusing at the moment on a graphic novel um, provisionally entitled Walking with Tigers. And that's really, um, so the, the Batek group that I work with lots of different groups, mainly Batek groups in, in Malaysia, Peninsula Malaysia, um, but there are different language groups even amongst the Batek who in total only number about 2000 people. So they're very small groups of people. Um, former hunter-gatherers, some are still full-time hunter-gatherers and some are, all of them are really part-time, a lot of them part-time, um, and some have been resettled on the edge of the forest. So I'm working on this book all about uh, the Batek Maya, who no other anthropologists aside from me have really worked with before. And half of my kind of doctoral work was spent with the Batek Maya. So they were forced to resettle as massive uh, deforestation in the area they live in, um, aside from when you get closer to the national park and part of their territories in the national park. So in that regards, they're kind of lucky. But alongside that, you've got mining, quarrying, ecotourism and so forth. So of course, people's lifestyles are changing um, dramatically. And they're very concerned about, um, about what's happening to to their landscapes, the forest itself, but also places within the forest, particularly these limestone casts, which they associate, which are kind of sacred sites, really. They associate with either creation myths, um, ancestral beings or culture heroes, or uh, powerful spirits that reside in the landscape uh, 
right now, or places where perhaps people broke taboos. So they're all associated, not all of them, most of them are associated with stories. So in the book, we look at those kind of stories. So we're looking at mythology through the landscape, if you like. We also look at um, other relationships with land and environment. So of course, Atex, like any other kind of hunter-gatherer people, or any other indigenous group, um, they use the resources within their environment for their material culture. So they'll be uh, making what you call lean-tos, like shelters um, out of um, palm and bamboo. Um, and they weave these rattans in very carefully. So what's it interesting with working with, a, with an artist on this stuff? If you imagine in a, in a typical uh, ethnography, you know, written ethnography, when you get to descriptions of things like, let's say, basket weaving or the tying of rattans um, to hold together a lean to, it can get really kind of quite boring and technical. Whereas when you do that through a, a, a painting, it can come very highly detailed to get a lot more detail and it's much more interesting to look at. And also, um, the great thing about John is he does this kind of hyper, hyper realistic. Um, type paintings he, he does of the Devon countryside. That's what initially attracted me to his paintings, these very large paintings, that are, as I say, kind of hyper real, focusing on leaves and birds and the things he sees living around him in Devon. But also he's particularly famous as a, a psychedelic artist from the, from the kind of 1960s. So, you know, he worked with all the big psychedelic bands and produced all the psychedelic artwork at that period and he still does that he still works with a lot of underground psych bands today but that kind of real fantastical side of his art alongside the realistic side made, makes him a great person to work with because of course with a lot of the Batek stories and myths you're entering this fantastical world where animals are transforming into people there are thunder gods there are um, all kinds of different kind of cosmic encounters going on um, that he can explore in that more dreamlike style of artwork as well. So yeah, I'm really enjoying that book. Yeah, working on that book. I guess my question about the graphic novel is what your key audience is for that. Like what, what are your main target groups? Are you looking to stay more academic with it? Are you thinking like Western non-academics or... Yeah. yeah, age group as well. Very curious about age group too. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, with a graphic novel, I think the one thing, obviously, you can go well beyond an academic audience with a graphic novel. But also, I mean, in, I'll, and we can talk about this a bit later. In my teaching, I already use a lot of graphic novels. And I mean, I showed, I remember showing uh, one of my, um, one of my dissertation students, their dissertation just a few proofs from, from the new book I'm working with John this year. He was, oh, Ivan, that's really awesome. I wish we had looked at stuff like this during our, our course, because I hadn't taught him another course. I said, oh, I, I use this with my anthropology students and so forth. So I definitely want it to appeal to undergrads in anthropology, criminology, environmental sciences, other, other disciplines like that. However, there'll be, basically in the book, we'll have an introduction where I will give a lot more kind of anthropological and ethnographic information and in a concluding chapter but readers would be perfectly happy to skip over that and get straight into the graphic novel and in that way it will be entirely accessible to I would say anyone probably you know beyond the age of 12 or something um, right up to you know pensioners so it's kind of it's a really wide you know wide audience but the act because it's written like a graphic novel that it's kind of the theory, if you like, the anthropological theory is behind the images and the text. Do you see what I mean? So it's kind of opening up a space. We're not gonna kind of force people in to say, this is what's happening here. You know, you should think this and that. By using imagery and a minimal amount of text in the graphic novel format, then it's kind of opening up people's eyes and opening up a kind of space where they can see what's or being made aware of what's happening, what are the Batek's relationships to landscape, spirits, animals, and so forth. But in a, in a kind of less controlling way, if you like, than text often 
text can often push you in particular directions. We're trying to open up spaces rather than close them down that way. So yeah, yeah for the audience, I think it'd be a fair, quite a wide audience actually, but you can read it in different ways. You know, if you're more interested in some of the theoretical aspects of it or more of the kind of historical elements, they will, you know, that, that's what the introduction and the conclusion, which will be text-based will cover, but you, the, the, the book will make sense without that anyway. Yeah. We mentioned this now, the, the text pushing people into a particular direction. And of course, the, that's the power you have as, as a writer, um, yeah. but also as any, any artist. So I don't know if it was his name, Joe, was doing the, um, this, the paintings in there, the drawings in there. Um, how, how are you approaching pushing people in certain directions in terms of the imagery? Is that something, are you bringing in some member checking in terms of checking in with um, the bat tech in terms of how things are being presented visually as well? Or is that something as sort of just a creative liberty of the artist in that? In that yeah, case? well, no, that's that's another great question. I mean, issues of representation are quite complicated. OK, and since um, since really the 1980s, as you know, there's been this kind of crisis of representation within the social sciences. Um, and, um, you know, you've got more and more, let's say, indigenous people who now are actual, have studied anthropology. For example, my uh, kind of, one of my supervisors in a way from my project, who was my local supervisor in Malaysia, he was the first Orang Asli, a term which means kind of Aboriginal person of, of Peninsula Malaysia, to get a PhD in anthropology. So I talked to him a lot. Um, however, the Batek themselves, they do not have a tradition of visual representation. Um, uh, I mean, other groups around them have a, a few of the groups anyway, the Juhut and the, and the, uh, um, the Matmeri people who are coastal Orang Asli people. They're really famous for their sculptures and they do these wonderful wooden mm. sculptures of, um, of spirits. But the Bateks don't do anything like that. In terms of their material culture of kind of artistic creation, you have hair combs, these bamboo hair combs that women and some men will wear in their hair. Um, you've got blowpipe quivers, which have highly kind of stylized pictures of flowers on them. Um, you don't, but you don't have much more than that. Okay. So um, obviously the book itself is our interpretation or John as an artist and. Uh, who he kept by the way he came out with me and lived with the Batek for a couple of weeks so, and got on really well with them oh um, great yeah and so they've seen and he took with him some of these paintings that he'd already done and they really they said they really liked them so um but I think yeah we can't say this is how they want to be represented represented or we can't say this is how they should be represented all we can say is this is our interpretation of the stories we've been told and the time we've spent with them and um you know somebody else I'm sure if i work with a different artist they'd be, they'd be painting them or he or she would be painting them in a different way um if i was working with a chinese artist or a malaysian artist they'd do it in a slightly different way um <clears throat> i mean there's all number of factors but that affects any mode of representation so yeah so like in, yeah yeah, in writing, it's equally true as well. But I kind of feel like, in some way, all this kind of permanent crisis in the social sciences is rather narcissistic. So, I mean, you can get carried away with overthinking and it's kind of, and, and you become obsessed with yourself in a way. Oh, am I doing this right? Am I doing that wrong? Should I be doing... I mean, at some point, I think you've got to think, okay, I'm paying attention. I'm trying to make it as gender balanced as I can. I'm trying to address issues of violence. I'm trying to do this. You take these things into account, but I don't want the book to be about me or John. I want it to be about the Batek. And of course, as long as the reader is well aware that this is what, this is based on our experiences with the Batek and someone else's might be something totally different. And not, and even saying the Batek, with these particular Bateks who right. are in the book, these particular individuals. These and individuals, yeah. Yeah, there's particular individuals that it's, it's looking at their lives, uh, snippets of their lives. So other Patek individuals will have different lives, different experiences and so forth. So, and there will be similarities because of how history unfolds, 
but um, we're not trying to speak for everyone saying this is, you know, is that, do you see yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I've had, um, we spoke about this very, very briefly beforehand, but with, uh, in the book, Paying the Land uh, with Joe Zacco, I think he has a, a, a very, very brief moment at some point in the book uh, where he's addressing that, that he's an, he's someone coming from the outside and doesn't really have a conclusion for it. He doesn't say, and because of this, this is how I am now presenting it, but he's sort of like, well, that's really complicated. And I had to kind of think about it and they brought mm -hmm. it up and it was weird. And I had to sort of confront that aspect of collecting data for a book that I will then sell and earn money from. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something that he just sort of, he just brought up, but I'm sure um, Rebecca has a, has a quite more, that was a comment, but I'm sure Rebecca has an actual question for you uh, yeah. about these things. Um, yeah, I, I found what you were saying about the, the representation crisis being a bit narcissistic really interesting because I do think that in a lot of ways it quickly becomes not about ensuring accurate or adequate representation and becomes more about showing that we have done it well enough, getting those, those points for being reflexive enough and representing enough. And I think that there's definitely something to be said for losing what the actual intent of representation is. Mm -hmm. So I think the way you're saying, like being clear about telling the stories you're telling, but not necessarily trying to represent the entire culture as a monolith is really important. Yeah. Um, my curiosity would be the people who are in those stories, um, are you going to be showing them this, talking them through this, asking them what they think of the representation at all? Sure, and because I'm in contact with them via WhatsApp all the time, so I, I can send them pictures and discuss them, um, fact check things. But the I mean, the the book is a lot largely based upon stories collected for my PhD thesis. So I've gone through them with them numerous times. Stories that I've been, for example, there's a few myths that are <coughs> incredibly complex to translate because of various reasons. You know, like, I just don't understand what's going on in that one. The ones which I'm not sure about, I leave out, you know, and I'll wait till I've gone back and I'll keep asking questions. They're probably thinking, why doesn't I get it? It's just like this. But if I'm not, if it's not clear to me, I'm not gonna address it in the book because I don't want to get something wrong like that. Um, but there was something that Tiamat mentioned about um, Joe Sacco's work, yeah. And I mean, in my in the introduction to my first book, the one on my, um, my, my PhD, if you like, um, I do talk a lot about that. I'm talking, you know, these, they, Fatex that I worked with, they told me particular stories at particular places in particular contexts and for, for particular reasons. Do you see what I mean? If I had been someone different, they would have told me clearly completely different stories. Okay. So if you let's, I'll, give, I'll try and give you an example. So this is from a different group, not the group I'm working with for the graphic novel. It's, it's a guy called Batin Bolek, who's a headman at a village in Kalantan, a Batek village there. And he was telling me um, these creation stories, okay, which are kind of clay man stories. So a little bit like, you know, how Adam and Eve were created, but, you know, God Tohan would take these, um, take this clay, create a man and a woman, breathe um, the life soul into them. And first of all, he breathed in what you call... Um, Nyawa Tom or Nyawa Bulan, which means, uh, Nyawa means kind of soul, yeah? And Bulan means moon or, and Tom means water, but that's, a, it's two words for the same thing, the water life soul or the moon life soul. And so when humans had this soul in them, they, um, they were basically immortal, okay? So they could, um, they, they were alive and then they'd kind of die as the moon, as you got the dark moon, and then they would, with the new moon, they'd come back to life. But of course, quickly, you know, this story then there was overpopulation, there was too many people for the forest. So um, Tohan, God, if you like, or the creator beings, they they said, oh, you know, got to change the soul. So then they changed the soul for what you call Nyawa Pisang, the banana-like soul. And um, that soul means that when you die, you're dead, you know, you can go on to the afterlife, but your life kind of continues, passed on through your children. Yeah, and the, there are various variants on this. In uh, uh, another anthropologist uh, called Lai Tuk Po, Malaysian Chinese Malaysian anthropologist, she collected a story where half the people 
um, because of this overpopulation, they transformed into, into trees, you know, so you've got the origin of some of the tree species like that. Anyway, while he was telling me that story, then he also started talking about politics, and it was um, uh, what was it called One Malaysia, which was a Malaysian policy um, in the in the twenty in the twenty tens, really, and everyone was given a certain amount of money, um, and and it was all about all Malaysians being equal. Okay, um, so one Malaysia, one people, you, you know, yeah, this country, yeah. one, love, one people, etc. Yeah. <laughs> Which is quite interesting in Malaysia, and um, because um, in Malaysia it's a highly racialized society, so the Malay population has certain rights. Chinese population are characterized as a different race entirely to the Malays, and the Indians as another race, and the Orang Asli as another race, with all with slightly different rights. So this one Malaysia policy was really interesting. It's the, the, the government. Um, uh, BM, the party called BM, Barisan, um, Barisan Malaysia, who uh, who um, who enacted this policy. It was all about kind of the, the marketing of it was like uh, we're all equal, we're all the same. And Bolek, the headman, was saying, "Look, Ivan, look, we've all got five fingers. One, two, uh, three, four, five. Five fingers on each hand. You know, we're all the same. We're all humans." And so, and the word "batek" it means human, you know. But it also, yeah. so you can use the term "yet yeah, batek." I'm batek. If you wanted to be specific, you'd say, yeah, Batek, uh, Libya. I'm a Batek from the Libya River or a Batek from the Go River. But they also use that word for humankind in general. Sometimes they might use the word Batek interchangeably with Orang Asli. So it means kind of indigenous person from Malaysia. Sometimes they might use it as indigenous persons, like showing similarities with, let's say, uh, Khoisan people from East Africa or something. Oh, they're just like, oh, Bat oh Batek Juga. You know, they live like us kind of. Um, but anyway, what's for me interesting is the way that Bolek, he was jumping from this creation myth into politics and back at that particular time, you know, and he was telling me that for a reason, because they weren't really being treated, he wanted them to be treated equally, like other members of society, but of Malaysian society, but Batex, like the other, other RIS groups, they have basically zero land rights. They're, their cultures are not recognized in the same way as other groups. So it's kind of through this story about mankind being created and all having five fingers, the link to this policy. Do you see what I mean? That's a, but he yeah. told me that, I don't think he would have told a Malay um, politician, for example, the same story, he'd told them something else, but it's very clever the way I think that myth, ritual, general conversation, of course you're doing many things, you know, and it depends who you're talking to. That's what I mean about kind of, I'm kind of keeping out uh, of the graphic novel, if you like, but mm. it's clear that what I've been told is different than what other people would be told. And this is my interpretation of what's happening. Right. I mean, there's, there's a purpose to storytelling, right? And mm. the information that they were trying to convey to you is different than what they would convey to someone else. So. Yeah, I think that ties back into what you were saying about how the book is really going to represent your experience with them more so yeah. than Batek in general or even the specific groups you were working with. So, yeah, I think that made a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah.